for me once again to be with the local congregation here and to worship the living God. Kindly turn to Psalm 145 and we will read through this psalm once again. I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Verse 2, please. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and holy in all his works. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry, and will save them. Shall we read the last verse together? My mouth shall speak of the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Loving Father, as we continue to look to thy face for the release of thy word, may thy blessed Holy Spirit fill me and grant me the utterance for the glory of thy Son and for the edification of all of us. We thank you because you heard our prayer. For this we ask in the precious name and for the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This psalm beautifully speaks about the being of God, the doing of God, the ruling of God, and the dealings of God with individuals as well as communities. Our focus has been these days on verse 4 where we Read, one generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. This speaks of generation witnessing to their own and also to the next generation. It's interesting, verse 5 says, I will speak in the singular. Then verse 6 says, and men shall speak in the plural. And then verse 7 says, they shall abundantly utter. It starts with the individual being in witness and then it goes on to the community and then it goes to the world at large. If I am not a witness personally, then I cannot expect my community to be a witness unto the Lord. We were reminded from Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, when the Holy Spirit comes upon the early band of disciples, they would be witnesses at Jerusalem, the place where they are, and then to Judea, then to Samaria, and finally to the uttermost parts of the earth. So, wherever we live, that's our Jerusalem. For me, Hyderabad is Jerusalem, and the places where you have come from, that's going to be your Jerusalem. Now, who is this generation about whom the psalmist is speaking about? We are not very sure, but I think that he is thinking of the people of Israel, the covenant nation. 
Unfortunately, though God intended Israel to be a missionary nation, they failed in the great purpose of God. Now we know when God chose Abraham in Genesis 11 and then in Genesis chapter 12, he tells him very specifically, very clearly, very categorically, he tells him, I will bless thee and thou shall be a blessing. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham is going to become a channel of blessing to those who are around him. To begin with, Abraham was an idol worshipper as we read in the book of Joshua chapter 24 and verse 2. They served other gods, but God one day appeared to him. Stephen tells us this fact in Acts chapter 7 and verse 2. The God of glory appeared to him. Where, when, we are not told, but he had a personal encounter with God. And because of that encounter, he had a witness. He had a blessing to share with the world. Now let's look at Israel at least three, four generations. Let's think of the generation that was in Exodus. As we read in the book of Exodus and Numbers, there was the first generation. They were in slavery and God brought them from bondage to freedom, from poverty to riches, from weakness to strength. This is beautifully explained in Psalm 105 and verses 37 and 38. The whole psalm narrates about uh, the history of Israel and uh, this is what he says in Psalm 157, 37 and 38. He brought them forth also with silver and gold and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Egypt was glad when they departed for the fear of them fell upon them. There was not a single person who was feeble. There was not a single person who was poor. God brought them from slavery to freedom, from poverty to riches, from weakness to strength. That was redemption blessings. That's what God does in your life and my life too. And then when you go to Psalm 78, that describes in detail the kind of ingratitude these people showed back to God. There's so many things that this single psalm speaks about. It says they were stubborn and rebellious. They set not their heart aright. Their spirit was not steadfast with God. They forgot his works. They provoked him. They tempted him. They spoke against him. They believed not and trusted not God. They were not estranged from their lust. They flattered and lied unto God. They turned their back to God. They limited the Holy One of Israel. They kept not his testimony and they made and worshipped graven images. In spite of all the blessings they received from the Lord, this was the kind of response this generation gave to the Lord their God who was their Redeemer. Before I sit on judgment against these people, I need to search my own heart. We are going to go to the Lord's table to examine our own lives. Having received so many blessings, what is my present response to this God who did so much for me? Now this was not a witnessing generation, it turned out to be a wicked generation. They were ungrateful to the blessings that they received. Then these people were destined to destruction. One thing we understand as we move with the God of the Bible, we cannot play with this God. He is a consuming fire. He is a God of love, yes. 1 John 4, 8 and 4, 16. But the same Bible also reminds us that he is a consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 29. We see the two sides of God's character. If I am humble, if I am submissive, if I am obedient, I enjoy harmonious relationship with this God and enjoy his blessings. But if I am going to be rebellious, if I choose to be ungrateful, he is not going to keep silent. I am going to suffer for my rebellion. I am going to be chastised. And that's what happened with this generation. The book of Numbers tells us that for the unbelief that they showed, they had to wander in the wilderness. 
true they were moving but they were moving in circles they were in a pilgrimage they were not in a progress they were not marching towards the destination god made them to wander 40 long years in that wilderness until all of them perished in the wilderness look at the severity of god we find the grace of god the mercy of god the compassion of god but when they chose to rebel we see the severity of god now we would think the second generation would learn their lesson the younger generation who saw their parents perishing in the wilderness conducting everyday funerals we would think they would become wiser this new generation which the first generation prophesied that they would perish the lord preserved them and takes them across jordan to the land of promise then they get into the land of canaan and what happens to them they enter into the promised land but they don't get into the possession of that land and repeatedly you read this phrase in joshua they could not drive out the canaanites benjamin did not drive out those who were around them manasseh did not israel did not ephraim did not tribe by tribe the book explains how they refused to drive out the canaanites the different nations gentile pagan nations that were there the lord told them specifically that they had to drive them out lest they learn their evil ways they allowed them to stay back and that was the cause of their destruction the lord promised that he would drive out all these nations taking hold of that promise they should have gone ahead and they should have driven them out but they did not they compromised with them allowed them to stay back what happened to them geographically can happen to you and me spiritually there are so many sins that god wants to drive out from our lives let it be selfishness jealousy envy evil speaking pride each one of us specializes in some kind of a sin what the bible calls besetting sin we trip and fall off and in that particular sin if saul's problem was pride david's problem was lying and lusting each one specialize in some kind of a weakness i need to identify the area of weakness in my life and constantly wage a battle against it unless i choose to fight and drive out these demonic forces trying to destroy my fruitfulness they are not going to leave me they are not going to leave me and what i spare in my life that's going to be the ultimate cause of my destruction god told the first king saul to destroy the amalekites utterly utterly destroy them first samuel chapter 15 you find that expression seven times there can be no mistake about not knowing it in spite of that he spared agag the best of sheep the best of oxen he said god's commandment is too harsh he edited it and what happened when the second book of samuel opens saul's crown is in the amalekites hand he brings the crown to david what i spare in my life that's going to be my ultimate destruction the second generation also miserably fails and then comes the third generation turn with me to the book of judges and chapter 2 the book of judges and chapter 2 and then verse 10 gives us the description of that third generation and also all the generation were gathered unto their fathers and there arose another generation after them 
which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. If the third generation is completely ignorant of God and his wonderful mighty works, who is to be blamed? Outside a public school, there was a board, it seems, where it was written, if the student has not learned, the teacher has not taught. So when parents fail to teach, children fail to learn. As brother was reminding us, till 18 years, they are under our patronage or our custody in our stewardship. If I am not going to grab those years, and teach them both with my lips and my life if they are not going to catch some of these principles in their life they are going to be lost forever so the third generation knew not the Lord and the book of Judges tells us how often they went into bondage terrible bondage in the land of promise where God brought them to enjoy a land flowing with milk and honey. You find the generations failing one after the other. And the Bible also tells us there is another generation that the Lord raises in order to be his witnesses. First Peter chapter 2 verse 9 tells us of the generation. Ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show for the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And today, the Lord is not looking at the nation Israel. He is looking at his blood-bought people. Now the world is divided into three neat camps. Jews, Gentiles, and the church of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 32. It is to this church the Lord is looking today to be a witnessing generation. He is looking at the local church and says, you ought to be the witnessing generation to this generation. God is after a corporate vessel as his witnesses. When you look at the cross, you can look at it individually and say, Jesus loved me and gave his life for me. The life that I now live, live in the flesh is by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's an individual viewing of the cross. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. But there is a different angle from which I also look at the cross. The church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Individual atonement is only a part of the purpose of the cross. But a corporate vessel is the totality of his purpose of Christ dying on the cross. He wants a corporate testimony. He wants a corporate vessel to represent him to a lost world. That's why Paul writing to Timothy, he says, Church of the living God, which is the pillar and ground of truth. Now a pillar is for a testimony, a monument to those who observe it from all around. So the Lord wants us to be a witnessing generation. As we already saw in Psalm 145, verses 5, 6 and 7, it begins with an individual being a witness and then corporately we are witnesses. Now, how can we declare the great works of the Lord? Firstly, individual, then corporately. There are at least three ways of witnessing to those who are around us. The first one we can call it as the proclama proclamational way of evangelism. Proclamational evangelism. That is the verbal sharing of our faith vocalizing our faith with our lips, confessing his name before others. That's very important. 
Whosoever confesseth me before men, him will I confess before my father. Whosoever denieth me before men, him will I deny before my father. In fact, it will be a delight to us to share about him if we have truly experienced the joy of the Lord. We may not have all the theology of the Bible, but if our experience is genuine, we cannot but speak about it. Like the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. The Bible says after she had an encounter with Jesus Christ, without any prompting from the Lord, she left her water pot, went into the city, and she told them what she knew. She did not quote a single Bible verse. All that she said was, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Is he not the Christ? John 4, 28 and 29. And because of that simple, honest, forthright witness, the whole village came to the Lord. That was a very unique incident in the Bible. And all the villagers, after having discovered Christ, they give him the title, you are the savior of the world, John 4, 44, 42. So you find a single woman without any prompting from the Lord goes ahead and witnesses to the whole village. It was the joy swelling up in our hearts that made her to go and witness about the Lord. Verbal sharing is important. In fact, in the book of Acts, which has got 28 chapters, and if you go by verses, more than 3,000 verses, out of them, uh, uh, 1,010 verses, out of them, 300 verses are actual speeches. Eight speeches given by Peter, nine by Paul, and seven by others. So you have 24 speeches. And it's a good thing to make a study of all these speeches, how they addressed different audiences presenting the gospel in those days. If somebody has to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they have to hear the gospel. And if they have to hear the gospel, somebody has to go and tell them. And if somebody has to go and tell them, somebody or a group or a church has to send them. You'll find that in Romans 12, 10, 12 to 15. So first we have what we call proclamational gospel. Proclamational. The second one is relational gospel or evangelism. Relational evangelism. What we otherwise call as dialogue or friendship evangelism. In friendship evangelism, you try to build bridges, breaking down barriers, finding common ground with the other person, trying to enter into a dialogue with them in a friendly way. And you find Jesus using this method. In John 3, John 4, John 5, Luke 19, you find him conversing with individuals, especially in John 4. It's a beautiful dialogue going on between the woman and the Lord Jesus. When you carefully look at the way he dealt with that single individual, we have a pattern or we can derive principles out of them which we can use in our own friendship evangelism. How to approach people, how to initiate a dialogue. There are so many things that you can learn from John chapter 4. The first thing that I learned from that chapter is it's the Lord who took the initiative. It's beautifully said, the first two letters in the word gospel is go. I need to go. I cannot expect people to come to me. I need to go where the fish are if I have to be a fisherman of souls. So he went in search of the woman. And then you also find him, he initiated the dialogue. And thirdly, he humbled himself in taking the role of a recipient and elevating her to the position of a donor. Actually, at heart, he wanted to be the donor and she has to be the recipient. He wanted to give her the eternal life, the living water. But the approach that he took was, he elevated her to be the donor and himself, humbled himself to be the recipient. He said, give me to drink which no normal Jew would ever ask from a Samaritan and that too from a woman. 
He broke the barriers of gender, broke the barriers of racism, region, humbled himself in order to benefit and bless that woman. Unless I am willing to humble myself, I cannot be a true soul winner. I need to understand the other person, honor that person. He may be a lost person, but still he is created, she is created in the image of God. If I am going to despise that person, I can never be a blessing to that person. God never despised me and I have no right to despise any. And then in that conversation, he allows her to talk. He doesn't do all the talking. Many times we think sharing gospel is a rapid monologue. You keep talking all the time and then you expect the other person to just listen. That doesn't happen. You need to make them talk. Make them ask questions. I've had very interesting encounters in my journeys when I talk to my co-passengers, sometimes in the taxi, sometimes to auto drivers, sometimes even to beggars on the streets. The kind of questions they raise make me really think. For example, a Muslim asked me, your Jesus is only very recent, 2000 years ago, or Allah has been right from the beginning. An honest question for him. I need to answer that. I need to make it very clear to him how Jesus has been right from the beginning. So there are so many interesting questions that people ask you. And my conviction is if you are an active personal soul winner, you will be a good pulpit speaker. Because you will understand how people think and what are the mental blocks that they have to accept the good news. Then in that course of the talk, she was trying to divert him about the place of worship. And very beautifully, the Lord avoided that topic. Should we worship on this mountain? Do you think that church is good or this church is good? So many questions crop up and I need to carefully avoid such controversial things. I need to get straight to the point. And the Lord tempted her by saying, if only you will ask, you will get the living water. He made it so simple. He made it so simple. Often we are guilty of complicating the simple gospel. Either by the jargon that we used. For a stranger, if I am going to use words like justification, atonement, he is lost. I don't say that you shouldn't use those words, but when you use those words, explain it to them as to why you use those words, why the Bible uses those words. Then as he talked even to her, he very carefully but beautifully exposed her sinful life. He dealt with the issue of sin in her life. He made sure that it was not easy believism. Unless a person truly repents of his or her sin, they cannot truly and biblically accept the gift of salvation. Sin is a hindrance in their lives and we need to address the issue of sin in their life. And by associating with that woman, the Lord allowed himself to be accused by others. Even his own disciples were wondering why he stopped to talk to a woman. Well, God gives us so many opportunities to share the good news. Relational evangelism. Very effective method of winning people for the Lord. Allow them to ask questions. Allow them to raise their own doubts, their own fears, their mental blocks. Try to patiently answer them, explain to them. Then the third way of evangelizing is what we call incarnational evangelism, where you become the gospel yourself. You not only speak the gospel, your very life is the gospel. Of all the three methods, the third one is the toughest where you not only experience the gospel, not only express the gospel, but you exhibit the gospel by your very life. 
In the Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27, we see Paul writing like this, Let your conversation, conduct be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Some years ago I heard a very powerful statement and it goes like this, Preach the gospel always and if necessary use words. Preach the gospel always and if necessary use words. Let your very life be the gospel that people have to hear. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2 tells us, Paul reminding the Corinthian believers, you are the epistle known and read of all men. Incarnational evangelism. How am I to reach my own generation? Just before entering the hall, we were talking about how there are so many lost people right within the church. Every local church, you find three groups of people. You find those who are unregenerate, they walk into the church just because it's close to the house or because of their relatives or friends or because they like the music. It could be any number of reasons. It's a good mission ground for us. As soon as the service is over, instead of meeting those whom you already know, if you can go in search of the strangers, you can get the fish right where you are. Secondly, there are those who are carnal people. They once began their walk with the Lord, but they are no longer walking with the Lord. Their objectives have changed. They are carnal believers. They are still babes in Christ. And that's a second segment that we need to really reach for the Lord. And the third one, of course, a negligible minority are the true spiritual remnant. Those who carry the cross, carry the yoke, want to follow the Lord paying any cost. So we are in this situation where we minister to our own local church by using the gifts that God has given to us. We are called upon to minister to our own local neighborhood and we are called to minister to the world at large. The Lord has chosen us to be witnesses. To be a witness is not an option. By calling, we are all missionaries. By calling, we are expected to be evangelists. There are only two kinds of people in the world. As a great man of God said, he said, there are soul winners and backsliders. If I am not an active soul winner, by default I am already a backslider. Luke's Gospel chapter 11 verse 23 says, He that gathereth not with me scattereth. You and I might say, well, I don't share the gospel. It is true that I don't win anybody for the Lord Jesus, but I am not a potential harm to anybody. That's your definition. But biblically, if you are not a positive soul winner, if you are not winning souls for the Lord, you are actually scattering the believers. The enemy uses our life in order to hinder the faith of someone else. Being an active soul winner is a privilege God has given to us. We are called to evangelize. We are called to be witnesses. When did God give us this privilege and this position? On the day of our salvation. We all know 2 Corinthians 5.17 If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We stop with that. What does verse 18 say? All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself and hath committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. For God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. And verse 20 says, we are ambassadors for Christ. The day of my salvation is the day that I receive an appointment order from the Lord to be his witnesses, to be the reconcilers. Shall we pray?
Shall we examine our own hearts today before we go to the Lord's table? 1 Corinthians 11.28 reminds us, Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. As we come to the Lord's table, the question that I need to raise in my own heart, am I a witness for him today? The Lord has called me to be a witness. The Lord has called me to be a soul winner. Lord Jesus said, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. If I am not winning people, somewhere in my spiritual journey, I have stopped following Christ. Because if I am following Christ, I will be a magnet to attract others to Christ. Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Let's ask the Lord and say, Lord, I want to be fruitful. I want to be productive, Lord. I want to win souls for you. I want to build your kingdom. I have no power. I have no strength. But help me to follow you faithfully and truly, consistently, that my life